Welcome to May's uh, Workers' Liberty London Forum. Uh, this is a public meeting that Workers' Liberty organises every month to talk about um, uh, issues uh, that are topical uh, for the socialist left and the labour movement. And this month we are going to be having a debate between Cathy Nugent, editor of Solidarity newspaper, and Richard Angel, Director of Progress, about how to tackle anti-Semitism in the left and in Labour. And so each of our speakers is going to talk for 15 minutes each, then we'll have a certain amount of discussion from the floor, and then we'll have our speakers back, and we should be all wrapped up uh, by 9 o'clock. So uh, I'm going to ask of our speakers who's who's going first. Kathy's going to kick us off, so I'm going to take Kathy for 15 minutes, starting now. Okay, um, you'll have to excuse me, I can't see the audience because I'm wearing my reading glasses. I had a choice between being able to see my speech or see the audience and decided to avoid all your grimaces and uh, <laughs> facial expressions and just read my speech, or not read my speech. Okay, so people will be aware of what's going on in the Labour Party at the moment. There have been several people accused of anti-Semitism. Uh, Vicky Kirby, uh, from Woking, Ken Livingston, um, Jerry Lawless, not Jerry Lawless, Freudian slip there. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry Downing, who's sitting at the back, and um, I shall be reading his response to all this debate at my leisure later, but not right now. And there was also, um, comrades would be aware, a, um, a fury about um, some um, allegations and culture within the Oxford Labour Club, um, which I'll come on to in a minute. Okay, so let's be clear about what's going on here. It's difficult to be clear, but let's try and be clear. Something is being used by the right in general, the Tory right, that is, but also by the right wing in the Labour Party, to discredit Jeremy Corbyn, Corbyn's leadership. That's one thing that's certainly going on. And you can get a measure of this by, you know, by looking about how wide they would like to go, how wide they'd like to push it. Um, and we could say some very critical things about people like Ken Livingstone, but, um, but they would certainly like to push it very much wider than people, the likes of Ken Livingstone by looking about at what happened to Jackie Walker, something that uh, she said on social media a few months ago, something that she was engaged in a conversation, no doubt it was very late at night, something, you know, a train of thought that was quite confused, and, and she made an analogy between um, the Holocaust and the numbers of uh, African people who were killed during the slave trade. You know? <laughs> She made that analogy. You know, there's a lot that you could unpick. There's a lot you could say about that. But nonetheless, this is social media at 3 o'clock in the evening, you know, three months ago in the course of a conversation. You know, it's absolutely ludicrous that that should be picked up on. On the other hand, there have been some responses within the Labour Party which are, there's nothing to see here. There's nothing going on. I've been in the Labour Party for 30 years, some people say, you know, and I've never seen any instances of anti-Semitism, ever, you know? So there's that attitude. And that seems to me to be a wall of uh, resistance which needs to be knocked down. Because there is anti-Semitism on the left, and this is something that the AWL in particular has had a long, long record, going back over decades, of looking at and analysing. And it's simply not good enough to say that there is no anti-Semitism on the left, including within the Labour Party, because there is a left within the Labour Party and there are people who are part of the Palestinian Solidarity Movement in the Labour Party who perhaps are soft left and not hard left, like so-called hard left, revolutionary left, leftists like myself. So it is a problem, and we can't tackle that problem by you know, pretending it doesn't exist. We have to tackle that problem by facing it down, face, facing up to it, and thinking about what, what is going on. There are lots and lots of problems with having that discussion and debate. Uh, not, not more than one problem with having that discussion and debate. One of the problems of having that discussion and debate is that people will say that you're trying to distract from the Palestinian solidarity movement. Um, and um, no doubt 
uh, there will be comrades in this room who will say exactly that, right? But that's not true, right? That's just something you want to say in order to conveniently forget that, that there is some there is questions to answer here, there's things to think about, okay? That's absolutely not true. Another problem with having this debate is the way that it is being set up. So there's been a number of uh, things already happened. One of the things is that uh, there was an investigation into Oxford Labour Club. And uh, a couple of days ago, I think, Baroness Royal, who was um, given the task of making that investigation, reported. She said there was no institutional anti-Semitism in the Labour Club. But she also said that there was a cultural problem. Now, I don't particularly have any brief whatsoever for how she would define that cultural problem, talk about it, analyse it, think about what the roots of it are. However, she said something quite specific, which was that Jewish people within that Labour club felt that they had to be critics of Israel in order to have anything to say in the discussions. Now, that's a very common problem, it seems to me. And it's particularly a common problem within the student movement because there is, for all sorts of reasons, and we could, we, I haven't got time to go into it all, but there is a lot of what I would call virtue signalling in the student movement. You know, you have to put yourself in a position of always being, um, um, when well, the case of, of, of the Israel-Palestinian conflict, always, always being a trenchant critic of Israel before you have a right to say anything about the issue, which is a very complex issue with a long history. Mm. Okay? So, but it's more than virtue signaling, it seems to me. It's about more than that. It's about the fact that you have to appear to be a good Jew. I mean, I think that is the analysis that I would like to argue for. This is left anti-Semitism. And it rests on the idea that the Israeli government is uniquely racist, uniquely imperialist, uniquely oppressive against other peoples, in this case the Palestinians, uniquely so, as opposed to like the UK's um, role in, in, in Ireland, you know? You know, it, it's not comparable, the way that it's trekked, the two situations are not compared in the same kind of way at all, or China against Tibet, or any other kind of situation where there is an oppressed uh, a nation and an oppressor nation. Israel is uniquely evil in that sense. Now, I have to argue that. I have to give you some evidence of that. So that's what I'm going to try to do. But this is where left anti-Semitism is coming from. And it is not racism, okay? Or it, it's not, generally speaking, racism, okay? But there are instances where there are kind of racist, racist tropes, if you like, creeping, right? But it's political hostility. It's not, anti, it's not Hitlerite type of anti-Semitism, it's not Nazi type of anti-Semitism, it's political hostility to Israel as an entity. Okay? But we have to talk about what Israel as an entity um, is, and I'll come back to that. Okay. On the other hand, left anti-Semitism does have some kind of relationship to classic anti-Semitism, um, because... It has what Moshe Pistoni calls an imagery of power. Okay? Um, that is classic anti-Semitism, has this imagery of power, a worldwide conspiracy for world domination. And in some instances, uh, some points in the sort of what the left says about Israel, Israel becomes more powerful in the world than it actually is. You know? It's it's um, it's it's um, above and beyond what it is, which is a re basically a region of imperialism you know, and a settler colonial state. Right? That's basically what Israel is. Right? It doesn't have an ambition to predominate the world. It doesn't. Right? And you can, you can demonstrate that through um, you know, what it's doing politically now, which is, for instance, not that much in Syria, given that it's supposed to be dominating the Middle East. A bit strange, that. Okay? You can demonstrate by what it's doing now, but also... By, um, by its historical role and its historical alliances. Okay, but there's a problem with having this debate, partly because um, we can't talk about, I don't think we're going to be able to talk about some of those issues, 
you know, some of these big, hard political issues within this discussion, were, is going to stay at the level of the sort of things that Baroness Royal is talking about, which is kind of cultural um, issues, people feeling excluded, those sorts of things. But we do actually need to talk about some of the bigger, wider, more historical issues. There's also a problem, I think, with some of the ways in which um, it's um, the discussion within the Labour Party is being set up. For instance, the Shami Chakrabarti um, inquiry, apparently she's going to report in the summer, which is already the summer. You know, this is the British summer, as good as it's going to get, you know. So it's not going to be, it's hardly going to be an in-depth discussion with lots and lots of people being able to report and put forward a debate and then it's going to go out for discussion in the party and everybody's going to have a role in, and a say, you know, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be like, I'm an expert, I'm coming in, I'm going to tell you what modern anti-Semitism is and, and how, how that's a problem within the Labour Party. And then there's Richard and Progress's own um, sort of contribution to this which um, includes a number of things, right, eight points. One of those points is a lifetime ban. Now, that's something that Baroness Royal has um, contradicted. She said, well, you know, people change. Um, indeed, they do. They do change. And lifetime bans seem to, 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 to me, seems to her, but it certainly seems to me, to be an utterly wretched way of dealing with a very complicated and very important debate. Okay. Knocking people's, you know, chopping people's political heads off and telling them, you know, you're out in the wilderness forever is a wrong way to approach things, it seems to me. I think it's also wrong to uh, do such things as give the compliance unit more powers. I've, I've been expelled by the compliance unit, right? I got a letter. It said, you're a socialist, we don't want you, basically. That's what it said. You know, <laughs> so I'm, you know, <laughs> what can you, how can you answer that? Yeah, I'm a socialist, you've just told me something I'm, I've known for 30 years, you know. All those years that I was knocking on doors, you know, getting the vote out for Labour, you know, having a few arguments on the doorstep, which I was told not to do, but then nonetheless, you know, I did, right? Um, <laughs> you know, you're telling me something I know already. You're a socialist, you're expelled. So I don't, you know, the idea that you can just uncritically give a sort of... A, uh, an aggrandised role for the compliance unit seems to me to be a wrong approach as well. So there's all sorts of problems, it seems to me, with having this discussion. We have to have a discussion which is about education, raising political consciousness, um, um, thinking about history and thinking about ideas. And that's, that's what we have to do. And we have to make sure that this discussion is not just, you know, amongst select gatherings of people or via you know, long written reports um, quoting this EU directive and that EU directive or whatever at the level of kind of a right-wing bureaucracy. But it has to be one that's, that's actually a bit messy and actually a bit difficult and actually a bit uncomfortable and requires people to think about what they think. Um, which is the kind of discussion I hope we'll have tonight. Um, okay. So what I wanted to do with whatever time's left to me, which presumably is not much, is talk about how we, in the Alliance of Workers' Liberty, would see um, the question of left anti-Semitism. Now, as the late Steve Cohen said, anyone who claims to be an expert in this area is just a fool. And I don't claim to be an expert. But I do claim to have um, read and thought a lot about this issue through reading a number of different things, including things that have been produced by Workers' Liberty in our publications. Um, those sorts of things, you know, go right back to the 1980s, uh, when um, um, comrades of ours who were involved in Socialist Organiser, um, a newspaper in the Labour Party, were accused of being part of a conspiracy, a Zionist conspiracy, um, by a newspaper produced by the Workers' Revolutionary Party. And, um, okay, so we were accused of being part of a Zionist connection that stretched from Ronald Reagan through Mrs. Thatcher's cabinet all the way to the editors of the paper, critical of the WRP, i.e. socialist organiser. Um, and you can see it here. I mean, it, it's stuff which is basically produced because it was produced by 
a bunch of people who were being financed by Gaddafi, who were being financed by Arab dictators. Okay, so they had to toe the line. And this is the kind of disgraceful behaviour that has existed on the left. Now, if you think that that's not, you know, something that's not entered into the Labour Party, it has, of course, because it's entered into the Labour Party via Ken Livingstone, who was part of, um, who was involved with these people in, um, at the time. Okay, so, you know, we've been looking at this for, you know, a, a good many years. I'm trying to do the maths. More than 30 years. And... And, um, you know, it's been right the way through from, um, you know, thinking about Galloway, who a lot of people on the left, including in the Labour, on the Labour left, um, are people that used to take seriously. Um, but um, the main thing, I think, that has been our contribution, particularly contribution of a guy called Stan, is about the Stalinist roots of anti-Semitism, which is in this magazine here. And it's the Stalinist groups of anti-Semitism that have really taken hold and have really, are really responsible for so-called modern anti-Semitism, at least modern anti-Semitism on the left, which is actually not that modern. And one of the problems is that the Trotskyist left, in particular, which has influenced the Labour Party, um, and influence people wider than themselves because there's lots of ex-Trotskists within the Labour Party don't understand, is they don't understand this history. They don't understand where it comes from and how it came into the Trotskyist movement and they don't understand how it's come into um, some aspects of the anti-war movement, um, how it's come into Palestinian solidarity movement to a degree, um, and so on. They don't understand where it comes from, and it comes from Stalinism. It comes from a campaign within the USSR, originally in the 40s and 50s, but then later on in the 70s, um, after the Six-Day War, um, and where Israel reoccupied the territories that have been um, occupied by Jordan and Egypt, Palestinian territories, and there was a renewed anti-Zionist, um, as it was called, anti-Semitic, slanderous campaign against Jewish people um, by the Stalinists in the Soviet Union. And that was to do with realpolitik. It was to do with their alliances with Arab nationalists um, and people, you know, dictators in the area. The Trotskyists don't understand. They don't, they don't think about that. They don't read about that and so on. And as much as they do, they don't, they don't really pay any attention to it or think about how it, it underpins lots of the ideas and there are lots of ways that people talk about Israel today. Okay, how long have I got? Uh, you're running over, but oh, okay. two, three minutes. Okay, all right. Um, okay, well, some of the ideas are anti-exist, and to, to the, some of the ideas that the Stalinists have are, which are things that, I can, that you can see today, are, are as follows. Zionism is the USA's watchdog in the Middle East. Um, this is, com is completely unreal. You know, the USSA is much more concerned with what Iran is doing and is much more concerned with what Saudi Arabia is doing. Um, and in as far as it is a watchdog in the Middle East, it's not a very reliable one. Um, time after time after time, Israel just doesn't follow the line in terms of what the USA might want it, want it to do. Zionism was and complicit with anti-Semitism. It's one of the things that the, the, the Stalinists said. I use the Dreyfus affair in order to um, bolster its own position. That's one of the things it said. And you get that kind of idea, well, that's an idea that was expressed by Livingston recently, wasn't it? You know, that Zionism was complicit with anti-Semitism. And it, it, you know, completely distorts the history of the Holocaust and the role of Zionist leaders within, within that, with, you know, under the Nazis and so on, in order to, to make that point. Um, Zionism is, is always a form of racism, no matter whether it's expressed by the Israeli government or whether it is a general expression of Jewish identity. Okay? It's always, always a form of racism. Only Israel is to blame for the Palestinian refugees. It's got nothing to do with Arab dictatorships. It's got nothing to do with, with um, Arab leaders refusing to integrate Palestinian refugees into those countries or give them rights and to keep people per permanently warehoused in 
in refugee camps, essentially, or refugee areas, ghettos. Ordinary Jewish people, and sometimes by extension those that defend Israel, um, are bad people and deserve nothing. Okay? So there's an idea there of collective guilt, that Jews have a collective guilt for what Israel does. Okay. All of those ideas, it seems to me, have to be ruthlessly criticised. And there's more. There's a whole bunch of them. If you read Stan's article about, um, you know, there's, there's at least 20 or 30 different kinds of pernicious ideas. They all have to be ruthlessly criticised. And they have to also, it seems to me, to be linked to older forms of um, anti-Semitism. Because older forms of anti-Semitism, which were about conspiracy theories and were about this idea... That, um, um, that Jews were heading for world domination are all underpinning all of these, these, these points and these kind of um, slanders that were put, put, put out by the Stalinists. Um, and as we know, we're living in a world where conspiracy theories are really quite popular. And that's because conspiracy theories have got a lot to do with um, the kind of society we live in, class society, the facts of inequality and injustice are out of our control. And the Jewish conspiracy is an explanation. It's not a good explanation. Um, and it can, you know, it can be as illogical as you can like, like. It can be rife in countries where there are very, very small Jewish populations. But it is an explanation. And it has nothing to do with the role that Jews have played within capitalism. Okay? Nothing to do with it. And that's one of the problems as well, it seems to me, that there's, there's some people on the left who actually believe that Jews have some kind of special role under capitalism, mm. that are specially um, rich, if you like, or have got some kind of role within capitalism um, that marks them out. And that, too, is, seems to me to be, um, um, well, at, at best it's crude materialism. And it really has nothing to do with how these, these ideas get perpetuated and, and carry on. Um, so, what do we need? Well, we might need training, but first of all, we have to know whether the trainers, as, as, as progress say, we might need training, but first of all, we need to know whether the trainers have been trained and what they've been trained in and what they think about these issues. And we have to have some sort of critical discussion about that, okay? Because it's not just a matter of standing in front of a flip, book, flip chart and saying, you know, anti-Semitism is bad and there is this idea, that idea or the other. It's a matter of actually of having much longer discussions and, and being able to sort of tackle these ideas. We need to have an, an honest discussion also about politics on, on the left or in actually wider than that about Israel-Palestine. A full discussion, which includes being sharply in defence of the politi politics of solidarity to Palestinians, but also about the problem with um, the basic problem with the left left position, which is that they are for uh, eradicating, getting rid of the state of Israel, um, and they have a, a one-state position, but it's it's very often not uh, fully developed and not fully argued for. Um, whereas the AWL, we stand for two states, and we're very clear about that. That's what we stand for. Um, very often people are hostile to that idea and actually stand for a one-state position, which what they actually mean is smash Israel. And, um, you know, we have, we have to have more discussion about that. We need informed historical context. And we need to know and we need to um, think about the roots of left anti-Semitism anti within, um, well, basically quite old Stalinist ideas, building upon... Um, classical anti-Semitism. Um, this is not racism, it's political hostility to Israel, and that's, you know, that, that's what we need to focus on. Uh, Richard Angel now, and uh, Richard, if you want it, I'm going to give you a little bit of extra time, because Cathy overran the time bit. Yes, Thank you both for having me today. Thank you, Cathy, for that contribution and being so comradely in doing so. Thank you, for Deirdre Royal, for having me here. It takes me back uh, a long way uh, to my student days when I last was debating with, uh, fellow, with members of the Alliance of Workers' Liberty. And I pay commitment to 
um, the work the Edward has done on tackling racism or speaking truth to power, particularly in other parts of the left, um, on some of these issues and consistently calling out anti-Semitism where they see it. And I think it is a great part of your tradition and one that I have always respected during my time when I was on the National Executive Committee for the NUS. Uh, the joke was that we had a aid royal foreign policy as the Labour student group at that time. So we um, often would vote together on some of uh, these, uh, these issues. I um, got involved uh, in some of these issues uh, a number of years back, mainly in, through my involvement in the student movement and seeing some pretty pernicious things uh, take place. It kind of pinnacled when I was standing to be Vice President Welfare of, uh, of the National Union and there had been previously some serious claims of anti-Semitism within the movement that NUS had not taken seriously and uh, Luciana Berger, who is now a Member of Parliament and some colleagues, resigned because of the, uh, of the apathy of the National Union students towards um, anti-Semitism and that had led to a piece of work uh, and one of the resulting parts of that was putting forward uh, the UMC definition of anti-Semitism to uh, the NUS conference which to be adopted by NUS and we'll probably come back to that particular issue. Uh, I was offered as a candidate the, the opportunity to get second preferences of uh, the SWP and Student Broad Left and some others if I abstained on that motion and I took the opportunity to tell them to F off and um, didn't. Uh, my uh, opponent did. They went on to win, I went on to lose, and I uh, think I enjoyed the second preferences of the Alliance of Workers' Liberty at that time and appreciated it. Um, sometimes there are some, uh, uh, some positive defeats that you can go down to. That led me to go for an interview with the All Party Parliamentary Group on Combating Antisemitism, and during that interview, uh, they asked why I wanted the job as somebody who's not Jewish and not been particularly involved in these things. And I said to them, I lost an election by one of your recommendations. Maybe I could come and help with one or two more. And was very proud that um, I'm the only non-Jewish person to have worked for them. But the work that we did um, in trying to change uh, on a number of levels the way that the government and the state dealt with anti-Semitism and racism more widely um, going forward. Um, so. I, Focusing on the kind of debate, the, the question asked, what is uh, anti-Semitism in the Labour movement and how do we tackle it? So that's a nice structure for what I'm uh, hopefully going to say going forward. The first thing to say is, I think we probably all regret that we are here today, that we have to have this meeting and this discussion. I don't think this is, those who are excited about Jeremy Corbyn, Corbyn's leadership would not like this to have been one of the things that dominated some of those first uh, months in his leadership. And I certainly don't want to be having this. I have had a number of very, very hostile conversations with people that I previously thought were friends uh, and, and in some ways comrades um, uh, that uh, has become very, very unpleasant by just being part of this debate. Um, but I felt that it was an important debate uh, to be part of. I think it's important to say um, that anti-Semitism on the left is not new, as Cathy has outlined, but it does feel more prevalent at the moment uh, than it has done for a long time. The Vicky Kirby thing obviously is a case in point about it predating the current leadership and quite frankly how inadequately that was dealt with under Ed Miliband's leadership. The idea that she could have slipped back in um, through the kind of back door and it was all kind of fine after a period of time because she'd lost her candidacy that somehow it was okay to let her back in I think is wrong and appalling and, and clearly should not be um, put at the door of the current leadership of the Labour Party. I must say it was a particularly low moment for me to see Jerry uh, Downing on the TV saying that he was a Labour Party member and that he'd been allowed in. I was, um, I, I was appalled, basically, and thought that some of the things that were being said as a fellow member of the Labour Party were ones that I was very, very uncomfortable with. And of course that crescendoed recently in terms of Ken Livingstone's comments on the TV. And the response to some of those, um, I think, is pretty telling. And there's a number of things about what Ken Livingston said that are um, really, really quite pernicious. Uh, the, the obvious one is this idea of Hitler being a Zionist before he went mad, being the, um, the kind of quote, uh, which is obviously um, ridiculous on so many levels. Mein Kampf was well and truly written by the time that um, this ridiculous declaration that Ken Livingston is desperately um, holding on to um, was written, of which he rejected the idea of a Jewish state, because of course it would be the home for the Jewish conspiracy that he believed was the centre 
of most of the world's problems. And he was obviously trying to organise the ethnic cleansing of Jews, and it, of course, resulted in wanting to send them to concentration camps, not the early kibbutz movement. And that is something we have got to be absolutely categorical about. Anybody who thinks, uh, whatever you think about uh, Zionism, um, uh, however way it might manifest itself, you cannot uh, believe that those who came together in those early days in a response to the pogroms that had happened in Eastern Europe and, uh, and elsewhere had come together because somehow they wanted to do a bad and pernicious way that Hitler could sign up to. It was about the emancipation of the Jewish people at its earliest stages. The idea that was anything to do with Hitler's project is quite frankly appalling. And while we should use these terms very, very carefully, that it is a form of essentially Holocaust revisionism to engage in that kind of conversation, that there's somehow there was a positive in what Hitler was doing until not enough Jews did as he wanted to and went and, and left the country. And then he sent them off to concentration camps. I think that's an important point that should be made, and I, 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 I hope that wouldn't be debated, but I fear from the uh, grunt in the room that that might be and might be a thing we have to come back to. Secondly, Ken Livingston did this slightly bizarre thing where he said, to be an anti-Semite, you must hate the Jews in Golders Green as much as you hate all the Jews in Israel which I think is a really um, uh, pernicious uh, statement to uh, put out there, let alone rest upon, because um, it is basically the well, I have a black friend kind of defence, which is, um, I think, pretty uh, appalling. You can be anti-Semitic without hating every <coughs> single Jew uh, that has ever been created or might be, and I think that is pretty worrying. What has come about, in, uh, and it feels that has been turboed in recent months is an atmosphere in the Labour Party in which Jews don't feel confident and able to participate or to reach their full potential. And I think Cathy talked about that eloquently. So it takes me to my second point, which is where does this essential anti-Semitism on the left come from? And I think Cathy um, went into it in some detail and had a, a very good um, set of analysis that I don't disagree with um, hugely, but I, I take potentially a step further. And I think essentially they see anti-Semitism and some on the left, and obviously not everybody, and I'm trying to be careful about my language at all times, but some on the left believe anti-Semitism is a victimless crime. Some have internalised some of the anti-Semitic tropes so much that they cannot believe that Jews can be victims, because essentially they are all either rich or powerful or both. And that leads you to a, a, a situation where... And of course, sorry, that is enforced by a world view of anti-imperialism, of which there is America, Israel, Britain is somewhere kind of uh, in that, and then there is the kind of good people almost in Hamas um, and elsewhere, and that's almost there's two world views, and you're either on one side or you're on the other, and therefore, if you are sided with the imperialists on one side, you can't possibly be a victim, and that leads to something very pernicious that I think we're seeing in the Labour Party now, whereas anti-Semitism is the only racism where the victim has no say in whether they have been a victim of racism, and I think that is really worrying. And to have a review in the Labour Party that has as its vice chair somebody who does not believe in the McPherson principles, mm. uh, really important principles that the left adopted. When I was in NUS, at the end of just about every student broad left speech was defend the Good Friday Agreement, yes, the, the McPherson principles and um, freedom from Palestine. That was like every speech ended and free education was in there somewhere and there was a few others that kind of were always um, trotted out. This was an important uh, document that was... Ken Livingston did great work, actually, when he was uh, Mayor of London in those early years, trying to get those principles um, uh, seen through the whole of the establishment, particularly, obviously, the Met <coughs> police. But I think, too... Uh, to see a situation where you don't, because you can't see a group as a victim, you therefore see that victim has no role in defining their racism is a real problem and does seem to be something that is unique uh, to the left and unique to racism towards Jews. What that then goes on to is a, is a, a debate about wanting to decide where the line on anti-Semitism constantly is. So Ken had this and a bar here. Unless you hate every Jew that has ever come into creation ever, you can't possibly be an anti-Semite. And I think that is very worrying. And you see that 
go on constantly um, through, um, uh, through the debate that's happening, and other people constantly thinking they have the divine right to decide where the line is and whether a situation is on one side or the other. And of course what that does is totally ignore that even though some of the incidents might not have been anti-Semitic in their own right, they might add up to a culture in which Jews do not feel they can flourish and reach their potential in our politics and our party or civil society. And that must be problematic uh, for all of us. And the use of Zionism as an insult, and Zio in particular as a swear word, has got to trouble all of us. And the fact that John Landsman has written brilliantly on this, in my opinion, and has almost been forced to because of the anti-Semitism he has received and some of the vile tropes that went into some of the debate about what he was writing about on Left Futures, I think should raise uh, a call for all of us to think about this um, very, very strongly and be worried about uh, where we are. Um, Kathy picked up on this idea of the good Jew and what goes uh, in with that, and uh, the very early traits of this from um, as if the Jewish community or the Zionists were using the Dreyfus affair to, for their own good. And you see this in lots of the debate, that somehow uh, some of us who have believed that the problems are real and should be tackled and have come about in a um, it, what feels like a fast and, uh, and noticeable way are somehow uh, using this as a political tool and a trojan I think it took Cathy two minutes before she made that accusation in her speech essentially towards uh, some of us who have raised this as if we are doing it um, to destabilise Jeremy's leadership, which I am not and I do not believe is the right thing to do. I had higher hopes for how a left leadership Labour Party would deal with some of these things and have been disappointed. But the idea these things were raised as a Trojan horse, I think, is disappointing. But it actually is in the same vein, because it is to say that to accuse people of anti-Semitism or to highlight anti-Semitism is as bad as being the anti-Semite. And that is what people are trying to do within our ranks. And I see it on my Twitter, on my Facebook, and sadly I have seen it in some of the messages from people that I'm already friends with and have already had a relationship where you've got that accusation coming through. And you see it through, uh, and you can see a kind of dotted line between uh, what Cathy talked about, uh, the collective guilt idea that all Jews are responsible for what happens in the state of Israel, but through to this idea that you can equate somebody that is as bad for for calling out anti-Semitism as it is for uh, being anti-Semitic in its own right. So, how do we deal with some of these things? I came up with um, a plan of action, and it came from uh, it, it came from a frustration, but it came with an insight. And the frustration was that everyone was saying this was bad, but nobody had a therefore what we should do. And having worked for the All Party Parliament Group, having spent lots of time looking at these things, I felt I had an expertise to offer. I wasn't prescribing the only way forward for doing it, but I was slightly fed up that nobody was actually giving out some things that we might be able to do about uh, these uh, problems, and therefore offered up some ideas. And like I said, they are not, uh, I I'm not suggesting that they have to be done, but I believe they are good things to do, and that we should do them. So, um, training for the NEC on modern anti-Semitism and unconscious bias uh, taking place. I suggest that that is not something in, in employed by a consultant uh, that's off the shelf, but led by the, uh, the Labour Jewish movement or their appointees as people who are the democratic affiliated group of Jews in the Labour Party. I'm not, not everyone will agree with their stance or their take on everything, but that is their prerogative. Not everyone would agree with the stance that LGBT Labour had taken on things like some of the minor details of uh, equal marriage when it comes to transport or whatever, but that is their prerogative. And we, if you believe in our, the solidarity of our movement, we give that over to those democratic self-organised groups to determine their way forward. Some of the uh, women's movement in our party only support women who are pro-choice, and that is their right to do that. And that is not a view that all women hold, being pro-choice. Uh, it's certainly not a view that all members of the Labour Party do. But we would not doubt the Labour Women's Network are the right vehicle for tackling sexism in the Labour Party and misogyny where it rears its ugly head. And I think it is interesting that almost that has been one of the most controversial things that I have said, is that the open, democratic, affiliated group of Labour Jewish community uh, uh, in, in our party should be the people who are allowed to take a lead not least because it is the best retort to this idea that these are victimless crimes. 
Um, equally, they should be within our structures. So the only affiliate that deals with equality issues that is not on the Labour Party's equality committee is the Labour Jewish movement. And I think that is disappointing. They don't have their vice chair uh, of the committee in the same way that, um, uh, that uh, other communities would. I don't call for more powers for the compliance unit. I just call for them to have the resources they need to be able to implement the rules we have already given them. I don't personally, uh, I haven't personally called for a lifetime ban. I supported John McDonald's call for a lifetime ban. Not that everybody should meet a lifetime ban if these situations occur, but currently that is not something available to the lay party to do. And it must be possible that there are some people that we can conceive of that may need to face a lifetime ban of the Labour Party, or as near to it that, you know, that, that maybe they can show some, but the sense that unless you show real remedial action, you are out and you know, there's no point you coming back every three years uh, a knocking. And it is interesting, I think, that some on the furthest left in our party seem to suggest that this idea came from me and not from John McDonald, who normally, in other debates, they would support and actually have been very good on some of these issues. Um, I, I, um, I, I supported the idea of an independent ombudsman or some way of third party reporting these things. This has been a call from CLPD uh, to the Labour Party for a number of years. I think some people fell off their chair when I was recommended that, that somehow I had become a member of the GRA or Momentum or something of the like. But I do think that across the Labour Party it's particularly bad because of the nature of power that is involved in the, in the, uh, in the, the public office in which we hold, whether it's school governance, local councils, leaders of council, members of parliament, etc. I think it is something the Labour Party cannot do. We are not, and we should not behave like the... Catholic Church and try to please ourselves. I think there is time on some of these issues, and it's the same with sexual harassment in the Labour Party, which I'm afraid is appalling, but of course on uh, racism, Islamophobia, and other issues across the Labour movement that must be sorted. I think we should have power for young Jews in the Labour Party at these conferences to have self-organised um, groups. I think we have got to go into the debate that Sally, uh, sorry, um, that Cathy talked about, about uh, a modern understanding of antisemitism, where this comes from, what it means to have it on the left. And I call for people uh, in a time of despair and when it looked like it was going to be bad to join the Labour Jewish movement in solidarity because that's what we do. When there was a problem in the Labour Party, I joined uh, uh, the uh, Labour Women's Network because they asked uh, people to. If you agreed with their work, we joined in solidarity and I wanted to show that same thing. But crucially, my approach to it was we have to find ways that Jews can be the leading part of the conversation in whether they are the victims, where the lines are, and how they go forward. Currently, they are being trapped out. And I think that is not right, it's not appropriate, it's not the way the Labour Party should behave, and it's not the right thing for us to do. I will leave it there. I've got plenty more to say, as I think Cathy could have gone on for hours and hours longer herself. I hope that's been a useful start to the debate, and I look forward to taking your questions in a spirit of comradely debate. Thank you. So I, um, uh, I was going to endorse everything that Omar said because I totally agree with him, but I realised that would ruin his career in the Edinburgh world, so I, would, uh, I will not make those uh, comments. And yes, I do regret that these things are kind of, have come together and collided, but I think that some have wanted to actively bring those things together, that this debate on antisemitism and this debate about who should and shouldn't be in the Labour Party because they want to make it about a... Uh, right of the Labour Party um, versus a left of the Labour Party when on this issue that is not my will or intention but there is a separate debate that can be had about who is in or out of the Labour Party and feel free to invite me back if you want my views on that but I think to uh, go into that will muddy the water somewhat and will mean I don't uh, stay within my seven uh, minutes um, uh, importantly so uh, but I do agree with uh, basically everything you said I also agree with basically everything that Kate said, other than to suggest that some of these people at the back of the room are comrades, because I think they are not, and I, I, I think that you should find, uh, I'm very pleased about that, um, the, uh, the, uh, but I don't think anybody who calls himself on the left would want to associate with what Socialist Fight have been saying in this meeting, in their literature, or uh, in previously advertised uh, material, so um, but I think we should... Um, be strong about that, and I think that should be something that is really important, because uh, in some of these debates, and if you believe that these debates should be hammered out in, in, in dialogue like this, people who shout loud and shout down people who disagree with them are, uh, are, are quite powerful, and I think that should be remembered in that debate going forward. I agree that Jan Rawls should publish her 
finding the its entirety, um, but I think that it's not the evil right establishment of the Labour Party that is stopping that, but those who stand on the left slate um, that don't want it to be published so that those things can't be debated and interrogated, and I think that is disappointing and we should have that open. I think that when we talk about um, the... Uh, clearly you can be anti-Zionist and go into various way, shape and form of debating what the Israelis are doing, whether it should be been created in the first place, whether the people who brought together the idea of it being conceived are right, wrong or the other. But it must be possible to say there are limits to that debate when you use tropes that would otherwise be used against Jews and when you could almost just replace the word Israel for Jews and see that they sit side by side uh, uh, and they are vile and anti-Semitic and we must be able to call those out. To say that there is almost no way, uh, the UCU had a motion some years ago that basically suggested there is no way you could be anti-Semitic when debating Zionism or Middle East policy and that is obviously and clearly absurd. I, I think it's uh, Mike, the guy in the middle, when he tried to again explain this relationship between Nazis and Zionists and in a way that almost equates that they had equal power and in itself is one that is quite worrying to suggest that, is, is that right? That the, the, you were talking about this term of doing the agreement. Like, lots of Jews were asked to do pretty appalling things um, during the time of the Holocaust. If you look at how the Warsaw Ghetto was organised, they made a point of appointing somebody who was within that community at the top of it to try and divide and rule and be pernicious at every possible stage. Within concentration camps, people were made more senior than others. It was a vile and nasty thing that was done um, as part of, uh, as, as part of a, a ethnic cleansing and genocidal activity. And to, to suggest that somehow those individuals had agency in that approach, I think, is really, really worrying. And somehow, I fear, has behind it some tropes about uh, Jews being powerful, etc., etc. And look, we can go on about um, various bits and pieces. And I get that some people don't like my my approach or some of the particulars about it. Well, I think that on some of them we really are just splitting hairs. And we also, some of us, have a very different view about what the Labour Party is for. And I believe it is about finding some way that we can get 12 million votes and getting the Tories out. Mm. And I get that some people are desperately trying to craft this kind of perfect. A basket that is ready to catch the keys when the Tory party drops them so we can have a perfect socialist utopia to come after it and there is a difference of opinion about that. But the central point, and I think Matt uh, uh, had this in, it, in his uh, critique of my response, is that you said there should be a different way to what I've suggested. I just ask, can the Jewish community wait for the cultural change in the Labour Party that you are arguing for? And I don't, do not believe that they can. I think you have to have clear mechanisms uh, because it, at the moment we are the minority in this discussion. Whether you're in the aid world or progress or those who are speaking out against the anti-Semitism that is taking place in the Labour Party, normally in doing so you are hounded, absolutely hounded on social media or in public meetings uh, as was kind of seen by some people this evening for just basically raising the idea there might be anti-Semitism on the left. Our friend who went to a Momentum meeting, had it knocked down that you can even have the discussion that it may even possibly exist. So I believe in that context, we cannot possibly wait, and the Jewish community cannot possibly wait, for some cultural change to come about in the Labour Party. It is time for action, it is time for leadership, it is time for people to say, enough is enough, there is anti-Semitism in our movement. We say we are better than others because we say we are an anti-racist movement. We have to mean what we say and say what we mean. Okay. Um, there, there is a basic, dif obviously there is a very basic difference politically between um, myself and Richard, us and Richard. But it's not a difference necessarily in terms of the Labour Party about a difference between the socialist utopia and a vehicle for getting rid of the, to the Tories. And we'll get rid of the Tories as well and we'll replace it with the Labour Party as well. But it's not about socialist utopia. It's about building a political movement, a political labour movement. And a movement is something that has democratic discussion, has democratic organisation, democratic structures, has a women's organisation, for instance, that doesn't meet for three hours before the main Labour Party and actually is constituted on the basis of properly organised women's sections, right? Um, as it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago, right? 
that's what we're trying to build, right? And that means necessarily having lots and lots and lots of messy political discussions, very messy ones, right? And it's just demagogic to say, you know, like, Jewish people can't wait for that political discussion to, ha to happen, right? If that's just demagogic, right? Um, look, there's an example of trying to change things culturally, right? And that is the struggle that women have had within the labour movement for centuries, okay? And that struggle, by and large, certainly the one that I'm in favour of, is a political struggle, okay, first and foremost. It's not about expelling men. It's not, a, it's, it's not even necessarily about lots and lots of calling out and lots and lots of, of shouting sexism, sexism, sexism at the top of my voice. It's about explaining, it's about writing stuff, it's about moving motions. It's about having political arguments. It's about unpicking the, the crap that is there and trying to, to change it around. And it's about having a positive alternative. Okay? So, you know, that is the way forward. That's what, that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about... Um, you know, obviously, you know, you need to, ha you need to st sort of state what's right and wrong. That's true. And you have to have certain rules in any democratic organisation that states what's right and wrong. And there has to be some line of, of you know, where things are, are indefensible. But in this case, about this debate, about, about what we're talking about, which is pol basically political anti-Semitism, left anti-Semitism, which is not about racism. Um, there are kind of like some underlying racist ideas going on, but it's basically not about racism. In this case, it's about, it's about trying to have, both, have that political education. It's, it's, you're not going to change things any other way. You're not going to change things by, by bureaucratic means, right? Is this a chummy debate? You know, do, I said right at the start, I thought this is something to do with, with the right. Um, you know, I'm not convinced by what you say, well, the, you know, it muddies the water to say that it's, it's something to do with the right. I'm not convinced by that because this is not something that's a new issue. It's just happening now, right? But I'm not a conspiracy theorist. All I'm going to do is say, well, if you say that, I believe you. I'll take you at your word. I'll take that to base value, and we'll just we'll just work on that basis and use this as an opportunity to sort to try to sort the left out. And I hope that is something that we can do. Right. The problem is, like, judging by some of the contributions, is this issue is just not recognised as being an issue. It's just not recognised as being an issue. People think somehow it's unproblematic that your political hostility to Israel is not to do with the things that the Israeli government or successive Israeli governments have done that have been fantastically oppressive and wrong. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got nothing to do with the Israel-Palestinian conflict, but it's got everything to do with other things and, and that are far away, that are transcendental, that are beyond, um, the, uh, beyond your criticisms of Israel. So that people come out right, with things like, these are my, my, my experiences, that um, if um, there's no left in Israel, um, all Israelis have swimming pools, right? <laughs> I.e. that Israel is not a basically a class society, right? It's a particular, peculiar kind of society that doesn't have classes. You know, we live in a capital, capitalist, global capitalist system that somehow this country you know, has no classes. That is just weird and strange, right? But that's work, That's a group called Workers' Power to say that, right? You know, at my own university, Goldsmiths in the Student Union, um, there was a big, big wrangle about, um, about um, um, marking Holocaust there, right? Big, big wrangle about it. You know, and all understated about what, what the actual hostility was to ho Holocaust Day. Nobody could say it. Nobody could say it out loud, right? And so they had to have a Memorial Day that covered every single possible genocide in history, right? Which, you know, who could argue against that? But why are they wrangling about specifically about Holocaust Day? It's just understated. And that's the problem with all this. The problem is not recognised, but it goes wider, wider, wider um, than, than Ken Livingston. It goes wider than this or that other strange individual, right? It's, it's, it's a, it's, it consists of a huge... Um, a huge, a huge kind of, 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 of different kinds of political ideas, of, of unformed um, arguments and so on, um, which are being pulled behind a basic hostility to, 
by people who have a basic hostility to Israel who want to see the state smashed completely. Um, and are more hostile than that, they want to see, you know, if necessary, if it, if it requires the Jews to leave Israel, then that's, that's fine, right? So, the, the, it, so all of these kinds of unformed, confused ideas of people are being pulled along by that, by that, um, by that idea, one state in Israel, um, i.e., you know, dismantle um, the, um, the, the idea of um, a, 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 a national entity that expresses the, uh, the national identity of people, the Israelis, Jewish people have actually lived there and have lived there for generations now, and some have lived there for very much longer than that. Okay, so no, his, no state in history, no, no national entity in history has ever been dismantled in that kind of way, right? Has, has volunteered to give that up, so it has to be done by violence. And that's the basic program. Right? It's unstated by lots of people, but that's the basic programme. And that's what we've got. That's the argument that we've got to have out. I think the AWL, in contrast, is very clear, very, very clear about what we stand for. We stand for an end to the Israeli occupation, something that we've had to argue for on the left, actually. Because if you say that you're an end to the occupation, actually you're saying you're for two states. So we've had to argue for that um, against people who are hostile on the left of that, which is another aspect of all this. Right? This problem that people can't recognise. Okay? Um, we're very clear about what we advocate. End to the occupation of West Bank and East Jerusalem, dismantling of the settlements, and an independent Palestinian state alongside Israel. Right? That's, that's what we have to fight for. You know? And in the process, we need to dismantle all of the crap that, um, that comes out you know, in, in the arguments that we have for that. So um, that's, that's a difficult job, it seems to me, and it's, it, but hopefully this will be an opportunity for us to get on with that.